My name is Lawrence Woodward. I'm um, chairman of Whole Health Agriculture. Welcome to this session um, on reducing antibiotics and thalmintic use in homeopathy um, through homeopathy herbs, medicinal plants <coughs> on livestock farms in the UK. Um, thanks for joining us. Thanks also to the OR ORFC for giving us the space for this session. I habitually um, start the sessions I'm in by saying welcome to the most important session uh, of the conference. So welcome to the most important session of the conference, even though you might not think it is. But in fact, it's highly significant to discuss alternatives to conventional veterinary treatments at a conference which is discussing alternatives. I, I've looked at various things in various ORFC conferences, and uh, especially some sessions that talk about narratives, how the narrative, the story is important. Well, so I thought I'd start with a narrative. I mean, the narrative once upon a time, by which I mean today, these days, we're facing an existential crisis in our food and farming system. And Particularly, we're facing an existential crisis in terms of health and in terms of, as part of health, in terms of antibiotic use and building up resistance to antibiotics in order to support unsustainable, arguably inhuman livestock systems. The story goes on that actually, if you look around, the answer to these problems in this existential crisis is there to be seen but no one's look, looking and no one's hearing and the answer is there in plain sight on farms amongst farmers amongst the farming community who develop the use of alternatives and part of this uh, answer is a truth which is undeniable but is inconvenient it's an inconvenient truth to the uh, industry, to the industry from those people who are producing pharmaceutical use on farms, but also the industry that involves the establishment, the policy establishment and the veterinary establishment. And that inconvenient truth is that farmers using complementary and alternative methods using homeopathy, using herbal treatments for the health management of livestock on their farms, those farmers are having outstanding success in reducing antibiotic use. It's an inconvenient truth that these alternatives actually work and that these alternatives can lead the way to a better, to a more healthy livestock and farming system on UK farms. It's the truth, and we'll demonstrate that through discussion of a survey that Whole Health Agriculture carried out, uh, looking at these alternative practices on UK livestock farms. We'll go into this survey and give you some staggering, striking results, and then we'll go into how these results have been achieved with the help of <clears throat> Chris Auckland, who's the head of um, the WAG Livestock Programme. Chris is, a, as well as being a livestock programme, is a, is a vet and an educator. And we also have with us Kate Scott, who's a medical herbalist and pasture consultant. We've got Sarah Kernahan helping in the background. So when I cock up on the slides, um, Sarah's going to put me right. So that's our, um, that's our programme. We will have some Q&A, some discussion later. Um, and if you, um, I see people are already using the chat, please carry on using the chat to chat between yourselves, but not, don't get too carried away with that and not listen to what we have to say. But if you want to, and we will be having a Q&A session uh, towards the end. So please put questions in the Q&A session. Sarah, could I have the first slide, please? <clears throat> So our session, reducing antibiotic and anthelmintic use with homeopathy, herbs and medicinal plants. Can I just draw your attention, I will several times during this session to the Whole Health Agriculture um, website. Um, and we'll talk later about the kinds of things you'll see on there. 
Um, as I said earlier, my name is Lawrence Woodward. Um, my professional life has been involved in organic agriculture, but I'm the chair of Whole Health Agriculture. Next slide, please. The, <clears throat> the story of antibiotic and anthemintic usage in the UK is really quite staggering. You know this, <clears throat> everybody knows this. 116 million um, spent on wormers, 290 million <clears throat> on veterinary medicines, 30% of all antibiotic use in the UK are for farm animals. What do the farmers think about this? I, I skipped a slide. Could you go back to the, the, the voice of the farmer slide, uh, Sarah, sorry. When we asked farmers, and our survey has been a mixture of a qualitative uh, assessment and also quantitative, in that we asked farmers not just to give the figures, but also to give their views. And what we call the voice of the farmer, the voice of the farmer, which really cannot be denied. And this is what one person said. It's worth looking at all alternatives to antibiotic use as we're fast heading towards the nightmare scenario of antibiotic resistance in human disease treatment. This is too important to ignore. It's a key part. Antibiotic resistance, the overuse of antibiotics is a key part of the human health as well as the livestock animal health crisis on our farms. Next slide, please. The farmers know that this is too important to ignore. The results of our survey, absolutely staggering. These are just the headline results. 57% of the farmers we looked at had reduced antibiotics significantly not just the low hanging fruits that um, people talk about and in the press, but absolutely to maintain, to achieve and maintain zero usage, 24% of the farms that we surveyed were achieving zero, maintaining zero usage of antibiotics on their farms. Critically important. Next slide, please. The farmers, in the voice of the farmers say this is critically important, so do the consumers. 74% of consumers agree that UK supermarkets should publish antibiotic usage, regardless of which country the products are sourced from. If supermarkets started for, to produce the details, publish the details of antibiotic use, we would certainly see a change in buying practices and that change would help the promotion of true alternatives in UK agriculture. Next slide, please. We can see things happening. Again, why, why are farmers looking at this? Why are the farmers we surveyed looking at this? Supermarkets are starting to push for lower use of antibiotics. One farmer said in the future it will be compulsory for lower use. We hope that's true, but we have to see with the market push and international trade push and so on, um, milk buyers in, <clears throat> encouraging antibiotic free to allow access to more lucrative markets. But critically, the farmer who says we sell direct to and our customers are definitely concerned about the overuse of antibiotics and chemicals in agriculture. The survey that we undertook ran from May 2020 to January 2021. We surveyed over 220 livestock farmers who use complementary and alternative medicines and methods. We can go into definitions of those uh, later on. It's a quantitative survey, and it's the first quantitative survey in the UK, and is unusual in the world. It's probably the largest survey of practicing CAM farmers anywhere in the world. Interestingly, it's not a dry, boring survey because it includes the voice of the farmers, what the farmers actually say. And those voices are powerful and insightful. Those farmers and their experiences really need to be listened to. This is the answer to changing livestock production in the UK. But no one's listening to those farmers. No one's listening to that expertise. Now that's hardly surprising for governments and mainstream researchers. It's hardly surprising that they're not listening. It's too easy to dismiss these alternatives as 
as, as Harry Potter medicine or whatever. Um, it's too easy to be industry driven. We would expect that. But what we also would expect is that organic bodies, people talking about alternatives like this conference, like the people who are at, at this conference and others to be more interested in how not just to modify the existing system, but to change the system. The efforts to reduce, to save our antibiotics are very good. No one's complaining about that, but are we really looking at true alternatives or are we, or are they just shuffling around with embarrassment about some of these real alternatives? This survey shows that farmer experience categorically shows that these alternatives work and that that experience demands attention. People have to start listening. These people in this conference have to start listening. Next slide, please. Possibly, one sector that doesn't listen to this experience is the veterinary profession in general. When farmers wanted to, the farmers tell us that when they wanted to start looking at alternatives, this vets routinely want to give antibiotics after most visits, just as a preventative, one farmer told us. They invite us to take in a mastitis trial, but want to discount our use of homeopathy and obsolem, which is an observation method. Farmers or vets like knowledge. And one farmer said, angry, I'm always told by the vets that homeopathy doesn't work, but I wish I'd discovered it years ago. I wish they'd discovered it years ago because of the major impact, the major benefits that they were getting. Now, after this survey that we, we're publishing, which shows the effective use of these alternatives on commercial livestock farms. There is no excuse for vets not listening to the experience and not taking into account the experience of farmers. Next slide, please. The farmers in the survey to list their um, complementary methods that they use, and they were self-selecting largely, but we can go into details if necessary, and you can certainly see that in the survey. The three most used were homeopathic remedies and nozodes. Next, herbs and uh, medicinal plants, including herbal lays, wormers, and tinctures. And then essential oils, neem and the derivatives, uh, for example, udder mint. Next slide, please. The headlines as to what um, farmers can achieve using CAMS, and you can access the full report on the Whole Health Agriculture website the details of which we'll give you. 66% lower vet and med costs, 71% in dairy farms of lower med and vet costs, 65% reduced antibiotic use, 69% of dairy farmers, 69% of dairy farmers stated zero low or reduced antibiotic use after uh, through, the, through using CAMS or after introducing CAMS. Next slide, please. In our survey, we looked at, uh, we did separate, we have separated the dairy farmer's experience from the other farmer's experience. 67% of dairy farmers have lower disease frequency and reduced severity of disease, which is one of the things Chris will talk about. It's not just about direct use, the health status overall of the farms improve once farmers start using these methods. 84% of farmers experienced improve livestock general health and well-being. 40% reported zero, low or reduced wormage usage. To reiterate, next slide please. To reiterate the headline thing that if we as society want to reduce anti antibiotics or even achieve zero, we have to take the results of this survey into account. What can be achieved through the use of CAMS? significant reduction in the use of antibiotics, not just at the level of low hanging fruit, which is what people in the pig and poultry industry talk about, but across the board. And 24, 25% achieving and maintaining zero usage. Next slide, please. As well as those direct results, one of the striking things from this survey and what the farmers tell us is how approaching and rethinking 
the use of inputs and how beginning to use complementary and alternative methods has, include, has encouraged and stimulated change across farm management over, overall and a heightened awareness of managing for health. Using CAMS has heightened my confidence to take responsibility for all my stock and well-being of all my stock. We're better farmers now that we include homeopathy as a tool to look after our animals. I feel in more control, more able to deal with issues. We have planned management rather than crisis management. These voices of the farmers, this narrative is critically important to bring health onto UK farms. It's important to the animals, but it's important to the whole farming system and the health and quality of the farming system overall. So we're now going to look in more detail as to how these results have been achieved. And I'm gonna hand over to Chris Auckland, the uh, head of our livestock program, to um, expand more on what actually happens and what our approach to livestock health is. Chris. Thank you very much, Florence, uh, for that excellent introduction. And um, I think thank you also to all the farmers that supplied those quotes, because really that's what it's all about, the, the, what the farmers can achieve on the farms themselves. Uh, my name is Chris Auckland. I'm a veterinary surgeon and I'm head of the Livestock Health Programmes for Herbal Health Agriculture. Uh, next slide, Slera. Um, I'm passionate about teaching and empowering farmers to achieve optimum health, vitality and productivity on their farms. Uh, next slide, please. And that when we start to look at this whole question of can we get a reduction in the antibiotics and reduction in the uh, use of anthelmintics on the farm, then we have to go, go to the questions in the survey. So this is a summary here, for example, about looking at can farmers successfully resolve conditions without using antibiotics? And this is looking at a number of common conditions. So from mastitis through foot rot, maybe metritis, abscesses, you can see there's a range of things. And this is all available in our survey. And it clearly demonstrated, yes, we can. Yes, we can support farmers to achieve reduced levels of antibiotics and resolve these things quite often without antibiotics. Next slide. So this is again summarizing the one that Lawrence has showed you already. That I know this is the effectively using CAMS on antibiotic usage to reduce antibiotics and to achieve um, or maintain zero use of antibiotics in some farms. So my presentation is going to involve a number of questions and probably hopefully a few answers. And I start getting curious when, when, when these sort of stats come up and I think, OK, some farmers are achieving this. And if some farmers are achieving this, perhaps more farmers can achieve this. And if more farmers can achieve this, why not all farmers? See, a lot of the emphasis has been within the conventional world to look at trying to criticize or put down CAM's approach to see why it shouldn't work, why it can't work, it's not statistically valid. But we see it differently. We, we see it actually, we look at the ones who are getting results and we get curious about uh, what are they doing different? So next slide, please. Why is it that some farmers are able to achieve these sorts of results. We're curious about that. So anyway, that's antibiotics. Um, if we go into wormers, next slide, please. And we've got the one in the brown at the bottom there. We, we, we asked the same question about, can they reduce the level of anthelmintics, the level of wormers um, on the farm and still get good results? And absolutely true, they can. So for all farms, we found generally, we found 40% of them found they could get zero, low or reduced wormer usage by using a CAMS approach. Now you've got to remember, as they do this, this isn't at the expense of the health and well-being of these animals. These are commercial dairy farmers who do things to a high standard and commercial uh, other farmers who do things to a high standard. So they're, they're not cutting corners, they're getting great results and great productivity and great welfare and great animal health. So yeah, this question then. So next slide, please. Why is it that some farmers can achieve these results. How are they going about it? What is it they're doing in practice to make the difference? Now, I've, been, I've been curious about this for quite some time and I've explored talking to many different farmers who are achieving these kinds of results on their farms to see what is it they're doing? And the answer is really quite simple. What I find is that these farmers are the ones who start to think differently they start to see things differently and they start to act differently. 
And so we're going to start to turn your world a little bit upside down to look at what this difference actually is. I'm part of the veterinary profession. It's an amazing profession. And we're really keen on things like disease and death and so on. So, so we are really the guardians of what I call the death zone. We have so many strategies for when things get really quite bad to bring things back away from the edge. And we can do an incredible job. We're passionate about things like symptom patterns or differential diagnosis lists or tests and investigations. We have a whole number of medical uh, therapeutics that we can use. We have surgical procedures. We, we do a great job at actually putting things away from the edge when things are looking serious, which is absolutely fantastic. And you might say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, in a certain way, there's nothing wrong with it, but there's a small teensy twinsy problem. And the problem is for the average farmer, they don't ever really want their livestock to get to the point where they're so close to the edge that they're gonna need that sort of input. They don't want to get up to this red level where things are getting really serious. What the average farmer is going to want, and I'm yet to find a farmer who doesn't want this, they want their farmer to be running in the green with fantastic husbandry, great breeding programs, good livestock management, good pasture management, good feeding, and so on and so forth. They want that green level to work really, really well. Now, here's the clever bit. Next slide, please. The model we start to see is that things never really leap straight from that green level where things are working really well with great husbandry up to that red level where things aren't working well. It never goes like that. There's always this in-between bit, whether you see it or not, there's the amber level. So when things go out of balance, it goes from the green through into the amber and then into the red. And when things get better, it comes away from the red back into the amber and into the green. And this is happening all the time. So the goals and, and, the, and the mindset of the farmers who get these fantastic results is they start to see all their livestock like this. They see their livestock going through their journey through their lives in a way that they're aiming wherever possible to keep these animals in the green. And then should they move out towards the amber, they take action. And obviously if it goes far out into the red, they take action again. And their aim always is to see what they can do to maintain in the green as much as possible. Next slide, please. With whole health agriculture, we have a, a fantastic holistic triage approach, a whole health triage. And this keeps things very safe and very practical and very effective. So should any one of our farmers come across a particular problem on their farm, we're not saying don't use antibiotics, don't use wormers, far from it. We're saying go through a triage process. And the triage goes something like this. Always consider the red level first. If you've got a particular problem, think, do I need to call the vet? Is this thing so bad that I need some veterinary attention? And if it does, call the vet. It's sensible to do that. Now, for many farmers, they identify something bubbling up towards the red, but it isn't that bad yet. In which case, what we say is leave some red flags in place. And what we mean by that is get yourself a, a, a protocol in place just in case things get worse. So you're prepared ahead of the game. Now, having done that top bit, the red level bit, you then come back down to the green again and you just reassess your husbandry just to check out what isn't, isn't working well. You might find some things you can tweak in a very short period of time. Maybe you want to alter the feed a little bit or stocking density a bit. Maybe they're longer term goals in terms of where you do your pasture management or a new housing that's needed. Either way, you reassess your husbandry and you pay attention and you change what can be practically changed. Now, having done that, having topped and tailed it, we invite farmers to come back to this middle bit, to the amber level, to start to see what could be changed within that. Now, to our mind, our way of seeing things, this is where these CAMS medicines come in so fantastically. They can apply themselves really, really effectively here. They, in effect, they're catching things as they're bubbling out of the green and they're doing something. They're taking action, which will hopefully, for a large proportion of animals, bring them back into the green again. All the world being realistic about it and being prepared that should things continue to get worse, well, of course, they can you know, add in the red treatment. Next slide, please. So we're, le we're less looking at an alternative to medicine, an alternative to conventional medicine. We don't see it like that. What we see is an integrated holistic approach. So if we look at the sort of the 
the, 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 the bar at the top there, the problem level. They're going to be one of three levels of problems you're going to have. You might be in the green, which case isn't really a problem, just need to maintain it, or the amber where things are getting worse, or you might be in the red. Now, depending on what level you feel that you're at on your farm or with your particular set of animals or a particular animal that you're treating, then you look to see what needs to be done. If the animal is in the green, well, you keep doing the green input. You keep doing excellent husbandry. And that's always a lifelong thing. You don't just get good at husbandry and then give up. You keep on doing husbandry, whatever. If things have nudged out towards the amber, then you continue to do the green because that's essential. And then you add in whatever appropriate CAMS uh, approach you need to do. So you do both the green and the amber. If things have escalated and they hit the red, then you also continue to do the green and you can also continue to do the, the amber. You continue to put CAMS in and then also add in the appropriate veterinary conventional medicines as well. It's this sort of intelligently used integrated holistic approach that we find gets great results. Now, is this going to work then for the reduction of antibiotics and the reduction of antiphomentics? Next slide, please, Sarah. Um, well, if we just start to look at this, we need to tell you another story. But before I get into the story, I'm just going to add in a few of the characters. Two key character players here. We have what's called the host. So the host is the livestock that you're looking after. So it could be your chickens, it could be your cows, it could be your sheep, your pigs, or whatever the animals are that you're looking after. So that's the host on one level. Now, on the other side of the equation, we have the pathogen. Now, the pathogen might be a virus or might be a bacteria. It might be a worm. It might be a fluke. It might be a louse. It might be a mite. It could be all number of things. They're there out to have a go at this particular host to see if it can bring it down. And there's a little bit of a battle going on here. Now, luckily, we know the host is equipped with a whole bunch of things within its own uh, immune system that can help tackle these things quite naturally. It has all sorts of you know, uh, chemicals it produces in its bloodstream that will help it kind of tackle infections, tackle viruses, bacteria. Uh, it, it's well set up to be able to deal with these challenges it has from the host. And in essence, we put that all into one block. We call it the vitality. We look at the vitality of the host, and then we compare that to the vitality of the pathogen. Next slide, please, Sarah. So here, here's the story. There is a balance between the vitality of the host on one hand and the vitality of the pathogen on the other. Now, if the host vitality is high, the pathogen hardly ever gets a look in. If the host vitality goes down for whatever reason, then the pathogen can further take hold and further weaken the host. End of story. That's all that's going on. So what's the take home message from this? The take home message is that from this understanding, from this story, there are two key things we can start to do differently. Firstly, we consider what can be done to improve the vitality of the host. Because if that's high, then the pathogen doesn't get much of a look in. And then secondly, what can we do? What needs to be done to reduce the vitality of the pathogen? Because again, if the pathogen's weakened, then it's not going to get such a hold on the host. Now, we're going to explore in a minute different ways of approaching this. Um, now, just to be aware that in terms of reducing the vitality of the pathogen, there's many things that we can do. And conventionally, we might absolutely rely on things like antibiotics and, and on wormers to try and sort of you know, reduce those pathogens, which is one way of doing it. That's the red level way of doing it. But we are aware there are other ways, with, uh, ways within the amber level we can start to reduce vitality of the pathogen and the ways within the green level you know, with husbandry we can start to reduce vitality of the pathogen. We'll come to that in a bit. Um, and what do we then do to improve the vitality of the host? What we noticed from our survey is that one of the number one results that we found across the board from all farmers was that 84% 84 84 of all farmers surveyed noticed that when they used the CAMS approach, they got an improved general health and well-being of the livestock. What that means is the overall vitality of these animals went up. They started to feel better, started to be better. And what we know from this is as, as they start to have a, a better green level, as they get stronger and more resilient and more vital, they're going to be in a much better position to deal with the challenge of these pathogens. And what we notice is that as they get better at doing the green, the husbandry, and the amber, the CAMS approaches, 
they have to they become less reliant on the red. They don't end up in the red zone nearly as often when their green and their amber is working right. So this is what we can invite uh, all our farmers to start to do to get better at the green and the amber so they spend less time in the red. So as we start to look at this, we start to consider all the different ways that we can improve the vitality. And we saw from one Lawrence's slide earlier on that the top two ways that people start to approach this and farmers using CAMS get good results with are with homeopathy and with herbal. Now, Kate, uh, a little bit later on, we'll talk about herbal. I'm going to just give you a little bit of a, a short introduction into, into the homeopathy. Now, the homeopathy, it's a, it's a huge topic. And uh, the, it, 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 I, within five minutes, I'm not going to do it full justice. Nonetheless, if you're familiar with homeopathy already, I'm going to give you a bit of a summary about how you can approach the use of homeopathy on your farm to in, decrease the amount of antibiotics and decrease the amount of wormers you need to use. If you're completely new to homeopathy, just hang on in there. You probably have a lot of bubbling questions that will come up and things I don't necessarily cover. Um, if you can save those towards the end for the Q&A, or, or come to the Hoover room afterwards. And again, we can go through things in more detail. And at the same time, uh, check out the whole health agriculture website. We have stacks of resources if you're brand new to homeopathy to help you to learn better. But um, we'll move on. So next slide, please, Sarah. So there are three key ways that I feel that homeopathy is gonna be useful uh, to help reduce the, the tendency to need antibiotics and to use wormers. So number one way is to help your animals deal better with stress. We found from the previous slides that we found that the overall vitality and well-being of our animals went up when people use CAMS approach. And with homeopathy, we can specifically target this. We know farms are full of all numbers of stresses of one sort or another. It could be the weather, it could be the feeding, it could be the stocking density, it could be the husbandry system, the list goes on. And each of these little stresses are challenges to the animal's overall well-being. And if you add any too many of these challenges together, that vitality goes down and down and down. And as that vitality goes down, you then add in a pathogen, then the probability of that pathogen taking hold is increased. If on the other hand, you can either remove those stresses, which is obviously useful with good husbandry, or you can support the animal dealing better with the stress, then it's less likely to have a lower vitality. It's more able to maintain a strong overall sense of well-being and be better able to deal with pathogens. Let's look at a few examples. So here's three well-known remedies. Aconite is a fantastic remedy for fear and shock. And on the farm, sadly, animals commonly experience that sort of thing. This could be that a challenge from something completely new happening Maybe it's the vet coming along to do some TB testing. Maybe it's the animals going through a race for some foot trimming. Uh, maybe it's I know, uh, new sorts of uh, things have been introduced within the husbandry processes. All sorts of reasons. I know, you'll commonly notice when your animals are scared, when they're going through fear and shock. Now, a remedy like aconite can be absolutely fantastic in supporting that animal's overall vitality in being better able to then deal with that, that shock that's coming in. Here's an example. We know for, that when you move animals uh, from one part of the country to the next, you will commonly load them up into a big trailer and you send them down on the motorway on that trailer and uh, they're all a bit shaken up and they're not sure what's happening. And then maybe the wind's rattling in from the edges of the ventilation shafts and they get very cold and, and shaken up and they get to the other end. And it's not uncommon to find they then go down with a type of pneumonia known as shipping fever. Now, that's associated with a bug, which you might then give an antibiotic for. Wind it back. If you were to have put in the remedy aconite before the event, you would support that animal being in a better position to deal with that challenge coming in. So this over vitality is going to be greater and it's going to be less susceptible to that bug as in when it comes in. Next remedy, arnica. Arnica is a well-known remedy, a great remedy for trauma and bangs and injury, which let's face it, does happen on the farm all too often. Perhaps the cow comes a little bit too fast around the corner and she slips in the collecting yard. Perhaps the, the poor old animal is going through the race and it gets bashed and bruised as it goes around the, sort of the, the, the parts of the race or the other animals are pushing behind it. Perhaps it's horn damage from, from a bit of a fight going on between two animals. And so on. You know all the different situations on your farms where these traumas occur. Maybe it's animals giving birth. 
There's a lot of energy that goes into giving birth. It's, it's laborious, that's why it's called labor. And it does unfortunately sometimes create trauma for the poor old um, in a lining of the, the uterus. So uh, this, this trauma goes on. Now, if we don't do anything, it might well be that poor old cow or that sheep is then destined to end up with metritis and need antibiotics for that. But what if you come in with a remedy like Arnica before the event, you might well be able to support that bruising, that trauma settling down to the point where the animal's immune system is quite in charge and can avoid any infection taking hold. Another example, Ignatia. Um, Ignatia is a fantastic remedy for what we call separation anxiety. Everyone's gonna be very familiar with this. Whenever you separate one group from another, the animals get upset. It could be the lambs taken away from the ewes. It could be the calf taken away from the cow. Uh, it happens regularly. It might be different groups of animals. You're mixing up in a different way. You take the younger ones away from the older ones. Some go off to market, some stay behind to be fat for a little bit longer. There's a change to the way these animals are grouped. And some of these animals get upset and you know about it because they bellow and they're difficult to handle. You come in with a remedy like Ignatia and you'll see the difference. These animals are a lot calmer, a lot easier to handle. And more importantly, inside themselves, they're feeling more relaxed and their vitality is good. And if their vitality is good, they'll deal with things better. I know one farmer once who found that his parasite management for his young lambs was improved significantly when he gave them Ignatia at weaning time. He found that they're less challenged, they were less stressed, and as a consequence, they had less of a worm problem. Next slide, please. The second way we can start to use homeopathy are these things called nosodes. Now, many of you will be familiar with those if you're new to homeopathy. The idea of a nosode, it's a homeopathic remedy made from disease material itself. It's a very simple way of targeting a specific disease state. So it's quite easy in a way, it's a bit of a no brainer. Uh, where you can look at a particular disease label and then you can make a remedy associated with that disease, a way of pre-warning or preparing that animal's overall vitality, that overall animal's healing mechanisms to be ready to deal with it. So for example, um, if we look at parasites, uh, the coccidiosis nosode. Now coccidia is a little parasite, which can be really annoying, particularly when you've got high stocking density and particularly for young animals. And it will run rife through a bunch of young stock who are housed during their growing period. It can be a real devastating type problem. Now, what many farmers start to find, if they include the coccidiosis nosode given appropriately, maybe on a weekly basis for a number of weeks, their instance of coccidiosis goes down significantly. If for whatever reason, they maybe forget to do that for a few times, then that's often when they then get an outbreak and often they have to reach for the red level treatment and they come in there with the antiparasite type treatment. But if they return to using the, the homeopathic nosode again, they find, again, they, they tend to get low or zero instance of coccidiosis, commonly seen. Another one, E. coli, really tricky little pathogen. It's out there all the time, and that can cause devastation for a lot of animals. If the farmer knows that they are at risk of the E. coli problems, then they could come with the E. coli nosode, nosode and they can put it in strategically um, for those young stock, and they'll, again, tend to find they get less E. coli, e. coli problems. Mastitis, again, every dairy farmer knows mastitis can be an issue. There's so many different factors that are involved in mastitis, so many different challenges, which lead to the end result of the infection developing and then potentially needing antibiotics. Wind the clock back a bit. And if you start to incorporate homeopathic remedies and homeopathic nosodes into the mastitis management re regime, then many farmers find they're able to get way lower instances of mastitis when they start to use these sorts of remedies. And one of the simple ways of starting to do this is to use a mixed mastitis nosode, which is made up from a collection of the different bugs that are commonly implicated in mastitis. And again, it prepares the animal's overall vitality to be able to deal better with those bugs should they be exposed to them. Next slide, please, Sarah. Um, and then the third way you can do it is to look at the disease picture you have in front of you. Now, this is the classic principle of homeopathy of like to treat like we're using a remedy that matches the picture you have in front of you. So for example, with infection, commonly we'll get wounds or abscesses developing on the farm, or maybe things like foot rot, for example. Septic conditions occur um, frequently. And again, it's often why we then reach for the antibiotic. If, however, the farm is well-trained in the use of homeopathy, they'll be using remedies like Heparsolf, which is probably the number one go-to remedy to support the animal to be able to do better with infection. And I can list 
countless numbers of examples where a farmers use heifer self very effectively and they managed to get a, a nasty infection settling down very smoothly, very effectively, um, without it escalating to the point where it needed antibiotics. Very useful remedy. Uh, often it's followed on with another remedy, silica, which helps finish off the job. So if you've got a draining abscess, which initially starts for hepar salt, you might then continue with silica and you find that infection clears up really beautifully. Another type of infection, uh, sort of scours type problems. So it could be the one caused by scoxidia, for example, or one of the many other viruses or bacteria that get involved with the scours in these calves. Um, if you've got a picture uh, that fits the, the picture of the remedy arsenicum, that can be a fantastic remedy to use for, for a large portion of young stock to help them get over the, the scour symptoms that they have and therefore go to full recovery very quickly. Very useful. Another example, mastitis. Now here we go, we're looking at the picture of mastitis and the symptoms that get shown. And there are many remedies that could be used for mastitis. So these aren't the only ones by far. Um, these are what are called combination remedies. And for many farmers, it's a great starting point. So the first one's called BBU. That's a combination remedy of uh, belladonna, Brownia and urtica. And it's great for the certain stage of mastitis. And if you use that well, you'll often find you can nip things in the bud before it even becomes an established case of mastitis. You'll just move it away from the crisis that's about to happen. Another neat little combination remedy is SSC. And that's got sulfur silica and carbo veg, which is a fantastic combination remedy, again, for a bit of a later stage of, of mastitis. And many a farmer that's using homeopathy well on their dairy farm will be extremely familiar with these as being crucial tools in their toolkit to help reduce the levels of, anti of antibiotics that are needed by supporting that cow to deal better with the mastitis challenge. So those are three key broad ways of approaching it. You reduce the stress or improve the animal's ability to deal with stress and then use nosos to help prepare them to be able to deal with the particular pathogens. And then you know your remedies to treat the acute disease as, when, as and when you see them. What are, we, what are we really doing here? What are we really doing in the way that we, we look at using homeopathy in the farm? The overall message of homeopathy is that we're somehow or another improving this, this vitality, improving the vitality and the overall well-being. And as we do that, we'll find these animals start to have a stronger immune system. They become more resilient and less susceptible. So that, that's what we're aiming at achieving. And we can do that in many different ways. And it takes a little bit of effort to learn things like homeopathy. It takes a little bit of effort to, to start to change the mindset. But I hope what you're starting to see is it's not that we turn your world upside down. What we're really doing is turn your world the right way up. What we're really doing is starting to build from the ground up a completely new model a completely new way of looking at health and disease on the farm. Now, it does take a bit of effort, it does take work. Next slide, please, Sarah. And that you have a choice. You have a choice whether you put the work in at the beginning or work in at the end. Now, you can do what commonly gets done is wait till the end. You can wait until things have gone completely wrong. You can wait until there's death and disease. You can wait until you get crisis, and then you can call the vet, and you can use your antibiotics, and you can use your wormers. It's absolutely fine. You can choose to continue to do that. Or you have the opportunity to put the work in at the beginning. Put the work in at the beginning, and you start to learn new systems and new approaches of how you can start to integrate this sort of CAMS approach, of how you can develop a whole health vision of what you do on your farm. You put that work in at the beginning and what you'll find, you will have healthier, happier, more productive animals and much, much lower instances of disease and much less of a need for antibiotics and for anthelmintics. And this is the essence of what we're about with whole health agriculture. And today we have launched our whole health agriculture learning hub. And we'll be telling you a little bit more about that later. But this is going to be absolutely an amazing resource for any farmer across the world who wants to learn about how they can use these sorts of CAMS approaches very, very effectively on their farm. So do check that out. Thank you for listening. I'm now going to be handing it over to Kate. Kate is an amazing young lady. She has been a shepherdess for, for many, many years. She is also a pasture consultant, so she knows intimately all about the things that grow in your pasture and the different ways that you can get plants thriving to feed the, feed the livestock. Um, and Kate um, 
also is a, an amazing medical herbalist. She knows awful lot about herbs and she loves teaching people about that. She's run many different courses. Uh, it's a pleasure to have her involved with the whole health agriculture team and what she does. So, so Kate, over to you. Tell us all about the herbs. Thank you so much, Chris. An amazing introduction there. Um, so hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. My name is Kate Scott and I'm a qualified medical herbalist, a farm consultant and a shepherdess with 20 odd years experience in mixed livestock farming and organic, pasture fed and conventional systems. Herbally, I can trace my female line back to around about the 16th century. Herbalists, either single or married to drovers, horse dealers and farm labourers. It's this rich heritage and the stories my grandmother told me as a little girl and the walks we took around the lanes of Emerald Green where my ancestors would have gathered herbs that inspired me to study herbal medicine at degree level. I currently live in Sussex on the 500 acre mixed livestock farm my husband manages along with my flock of pasture fed lamb at foot Paul Dorset sheep whose milk I use to make soaps with herbs forage from the field and hedgerow. As a medical herbalist and farmer, it was a eureka moment when, around about 16 years ago, I realised an inextricable connection between my two passions, with my knowledge of native British plants and their medicinal properties being directly transferable to the field and the livestock I've worked with over the years. The focus in all animal and human health is prevention, and by enabling access to diverse pasture rich in native British forbs or herbs, to aid selective grazing and self-medication before an emergency or red light as described by Chris previously has reached, we help ruminants in our care achieve optimum health and nutrition. Pre-war pastures in the UK were generally diverse and species rich. However, after the war amid government concerns about the food crisis, emphasis was placed on productivity. Pastures and hedges were ripped out, hedges to make way for arable crops and larger machinery. Pastures replaced by fast growing rye grasses. Even the stock became bred for faster growing, bigger breeds. We've all but lost some extremely important meadow plants in pasture. Those plants are essential to biodiversity, soil and flock and herd health. Reintroducing these legumes and forbs is essential to natural animal health and has the knock on effect of increasing soil microbial action, carbon sequestration and biodiversity. Those herbs or forbs found in traditional meadows and herbal layers are intensely vitamin and mineral rich, with deep rooted varieties unlocking minerals from deep down within the soil. Many of our native plants do not fit neatly in a box. For example, dandelion and plantain are plants of both field and hedgerow. Nettle and yarrow will happily grow just about anywhere, and all can be seen both as food and harvested to make medicines, both for our livestock and ourselves. As the old adage goes, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Dandelions, for example, are potassium rich and nettles packed full of nutrients such as iron and calcium. So I think there's a slide on dandelions, all of which contribute to herd and flock immunity. So lowering the necessity for routine anthelmintic drenches and antibiotic use. If, a slide, if an animal is ill or lacking a vital nutrient, it will often actively seek out something, whether a plant or inorganic substance, to rectify the problem. Sorry, sorry, I can go back one. I first observed this when I had the herd of goats on our first farm in Wales. Nannies would take their kids to certain plants, greedily devouring some and actively stomping on others to teach them what to eat and what to leave well alone. Don't forget the importance of our hedgerow plants, trees and shrubs in the equation either. Many of which are rich in vitamins, minerals and plant chemicals, which contribute to ruminant health. Have you ever observed how livestock moving from field to field along lanes and tracks will do their utmost to stop and browse the hedges? One of many advantages of silvopasture and agroforestry. This access to naturally occurring vitamin and mineral rich plants is key to increasing immunity, vitality and resistance to disease. Herbs harvested for use as medicines have been used for centuries to treat both animals and humans. Modern research has played a huge part in tying together traditional knowledge and increasing our understanding of how the pokey little chemicals plants contain, their secondary metabolites or phytochemicals, work within the body to support good health. Phytochemicals follow similar pharmacological or biological pathways within the body as orthodox medications. In fact, around 75% of orthodox medicines have their roots within a chemical extracted from plants. Plants can have medicinal benefits within pasture, as often animals instinctively know what they need at any given time, 
or they can be harvested and prepared, administered by feeding fresh or dried as an infusion, herbal vinegar or tincture, which can be added to drinking water or used as a drench. Topically, herbs also have a place with styptic or wound healing and antimicrobial properties. With the emergence of anthelmintic resistant parasites in ruminant species, especially sheep and goats, it is essential to lower the use of proprietary drenches wherever possible. Quite aside from the estimated cost to farmers each year, these drenches can impact on biodiversity above and below ground. EU projects have studied chicory, sandpoint and birdsfoot trefoil and the effect of their tannins and parasite control. Tannins are phytochemicals which attach to proteins that have a drying or astringent effect, making the gut inhospitable to parasites. Have you ever noticed the drying effect black tea has on your mouth as opposed to tea with added milk? This is because the tannins in black tea instantly attach to the proteins in your mouth, whereas the milk is added, they attach to the milk protein. Tannin-rich plants such as sandpoin are one of the keys to reducing routine anthelmintic use in the field. As one of our oldest meadow plants, I had not actually encountered it until around about six years ago and was struck by how beautiful it was and how tragic that it had taken me so many years to witness it in pasture. Research shows it to be high in tannin and polyphenol composition. Condensed tannins present in Onobrica species have been shown to confer anthelmintic properties, increase protein utilization and prevent bloat. They may also have the potential to re reduce greenhouse gas emissions, according to research. Sandpoint has been shown to interrupt the three stages of parasite development, from egg to larvae to adult worm. And as part of a, a diverse lay, it's an incredibly valuable plant. Moving away from tannins for just a minute, I'd like to introduce the benefits of other medicinal pasture plants. Firstly, I'll introduce plantain, Plantago lanceolata, which has lance-shaped rib leaves, and Plantago major, with broad rounded also rib leaves, are interchangeable and easily recognizable. Happily grazed in the field, as a medicine, it is rich in phytochemicals. Plantain has been shown to be anti-inflammatory and demulcent or soothing, both internally and externally, and antiseptic. It's also an expectorant, helping with coughs, and mildly astringent, so helping prevent scours. Externally, I've used it to good effect in combination with other herbs to ease mastitis and wounds. It actually works far better than our traditional dock leaves to ease nettle stings, so do try it and then get caught out in the field. Plantain when grazed contains minerals such as potassium, copper, essential for immunity, zinc for T cell function and reproductive health, as well as vitamin C and carotenes, antioxidants which are essential for good immune function. Packed full of vitamins including A and C and rich in potassium, calcium and folate, dandelion is a deep-rooted weed, a valuable and nutritious plant for both animals and humans. It was traditionally used as a spring tonic herb due to its nutritional composition. Medicinally, the leaves are diuretic, hence the French name, Tisson Lee yet replace potassium, unlike orthodox diuretics. The roots, which pigs love to eat, can be harvested as a medicine. They aid phase two liver detoxification and act as a mild laxative to remove toxins from the body. And in the field, its deep roots help unlock minerals from down within the soil. I remember when I was studying selective grazing a few years ago now, I noticed that native Shetlands and Herdwicks would happily graze dandelion leaves whereas the farm's commercial flock of plins largely ignored them and munched the sweet nectar-rich flower heads instead. A sad sign, perhaps, that commercial breeds are beginning to lose some of the natural intuition, which as human beings have done over the centuries. Another plant now well known, researched and included in most herbal lay mixes with tannin-rich leaves, which are so important in controlling worm burden, is chicory, with its vibrant, unmissable blue flowers. Being bitter, it stimulates digestive and liver function, and the harvested roots are the main ingredient in the old traditional camp coffee. One of my favorite plants, yarrow, was widely used by the Romans as a wound herb on the battlefield. Achillea from Achilles' heel, a millifolium from its thousands of tiny leaflets, it has in fact so many uses it would be impossible to discuss them all here today. Nutritionally rich, it too contains vitamin C, along with A, potassium, magnesium, zinc and B3, amongst others. We used to eat the leaves ourselves many years ago as part of a medieval spring tonic salad. Externally, it's my go-to wound healing herb, anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial. I've used it on many by a bird on a ram's back and in combination with other herbs for sheep's feet, 
as a vulnerary or wound healing herb that has antimicrobial properties and unlike comfrey encourages cell regeneration from the inside out so it does not trap bacteria and dirt in wounds helping aid recovery without infection wild carrot next slide please another very beautiful plant especially when in seed mainly seen these days on our roadside verges is traditionally anthelmintic and also used to stimulate milk flow and uterine contractions so best avoided internally during pregnancy bird's foot trefoil contains condensed tannins helping with control of parasite burden nutritionally rich it contains selenium and has also been shown to improve uptake of proteins in grazing ruminants as well as preventing bloat nettle is abundant throughout our hedgerows and fields although largely ignored or seen as a weed to be destroyed it is however incredibly nutritious and although some ruminants will happily munch nettle in the field in hedgerow it is generally more palatable dried nettle hay used to be commonplace with nettle size to dry for later in the year Rich in linoleic acid and antioxidants for immunity, it contains C, A, and iron. I try to make dried nettle freely available to heavily pregnant and nursing livestock, and will make a cold tea infusion for convalescing animals. Of course, there isn't enough time today to discuss all plants valuable to livestock health, but I'd like to just touch on a couple more. The beautiful fuma tree with its smoky leaves and dusky flowers, once commonplace in our meadows, and the food of our beloved endangered turtle dove has been shown to be an effective anthelmintic, with up to 100% reduction in faecal egg counts when administered medicinally as a powder. Two very good reasons to reintroduce this now rarely seen plant. I only encountered it myself last year when I scrambled eagerly down a steep slope to attempt to photograph, precariously perched on the edge of one of our farm lakes. Wormwood has been shown to suppress barber pole worm in studies of Nubian goats. An Ella campaign has been proven to effect effective in reducing roundworms from human beings. Plants also have a huge part to play because of their antimicrobial properties. The word antibiotic actually means against life, with two types, bactericidal, which kill bacteria, and bacteriostatic, which helps slow their growth. With antibiotic resistance now recognised as a massive issue, and with consumer awareness of the importance of avoidance wherever possible in livestock, bred from meat and milk. It's time to look in more detail at alternative options. Identified plant sources of bacteria killing chemicals include the essential oils of oregano and tea tree, mint and peppermint, which is part why they're used in toothpaste, clove, black cumin or nitrous, contains powerful antibacterial compounds which can inhibit bacteria from attaching to cells. Cat's claw has proven antimicrobial effects and can inhibit the activity of streptococcus, staphylococcus, and also acts as an immunomodulator. Witch hazel has been shown to help with staphylococcal infections topically. One plant I've left to the end, widely researched for both its antimicrobial and potential antimintic effects is garlic, an invaluable plant in our farm medicine chest. Wild garlic in field margins as a food is fantastic self-medication. While simple preparations can be made with crushed garlic bulbs to help treat a huge range of illnesses. Studies show that the compound responsible for its actions is allicin. This compound is created when the bulb is crushed. Studies using crushed garlic have been effective in reducing worm burden. However, those trials using the whole bulb have not been as successful. I hope I've been able to give you a small insight today into the world of phytochemicals and plant-based medicine and nutrition and why it's such a fascinating subject and so important in a world of transitional agriculture. Thank you for listening. I'll, I'll pass you back now to, I think, Lawrence. Great, thank you. Um, there's some, just to remind you, there's some um, rather um, lively chat going on in the chat. Um, so please have a look at that. Um, there's also uh, some questions in the Q&A, please. Uh, look at that and add to um, uh, to them. We won't have time to go and deal with all of the questions and all of the points raised, but we do have this Hoover or Woover or whatever it's called session um, afterwards that we can deal with in more detail. Um, so we've learned about remedies, we've learned about treatments, <clears throat> and we've um, had an indication of how they fit within overall farm management. 
And that's a critical point, which came up in the chat. Somebody made the point that um, all of these things are very well, but it's basically basic husbandry, basic management that's most important. No one's denying that. Good, sound, balanced husbandry, um, a balanced, holistic approach to livestock uh, management, the whole farm system management is the basis of all of this. Uh, the question is how much of this can help in terms of transition and how it deals with, with shocks within that system, which comes back to the experience of farmers and how farmers put remedies, treatments, and whole, whole farm system management together. We're going to show a short film now, which actually goes into some of that or gives you an insight into those things. Sally Wood and Gary, Gary Eam are Pembrokeshire dairy farmers. Uh, back in 2004, they began to question the amount of artificial chemicals, vaccines, wormers and drugs that they were using on their farms. In 2008, they discovered homeopathy. 2012, they began, Sally began to change as a homeopath. When they discovered homeopathy, they were still farming conventionally. They've subsequently converted to organic. Sally trained as, an, as a homeopath. This journey through homeopathy, through um, natural systems, then through organic, changed the way they view the entire farm and how that view and perspective of how they saw the entire farm changed at different stages on their journey. So we're just going to see this short film of Sally and Gary discussing what they do and how they came to it. Sarah, please, the film. Well, I'd had a few, ex you know, bad experiences with um, drugs and, you know, for a couple of things. Prescription drugs. Prescription <laughs> drugs, yes. Yeah, <laughs> let's get that right. <laughs> Prescription drugs. Um, and, you know, it makes you think, what are you doing? And then one day we were using Roundup, which... Um, you know, we were round, you know, spraying Roundup, then we were silaging, five days after that you're allowed to, you can silage it and then you feed it back to the cows and then we're eating it and somehow the, the penny clicked there that this doesn't seem, some, somehow doesn't seem right. Um, and then we sort of, I don't know, we, ju we just sort of felt it, it wasn't right what we were doing, I suppose. I um, mean, we've never been big consumers of, uh, as far as, you know, drugs and vaccines and antibiotics and you know feed you know we've always been a low input low output system then and it, it basically just sort of all fitted together then is the fact that we we almost felt we were farming semi-organically but didn't actually go the whole hog and it was just we took that jump to do it then and it it just sort of well, it clicked then, didn't it? Mm. So. It's, we're using a lot more herbs, putting herbal lays in and trying to bring up minerals and things from deeper down within the soils, then getting different rooting depths and, you know, offering the animals a more diverse sward then. So hopefully then that will in turn then improve the soil as well then. Seems to be working so far. So. We're aiming to sort of plant to, so the cattle self-medicate, which what is what they used to do was forage for what they needed. So if we've put the plants back in there or the shrubs or whatever, uh, we're hoping they'll look after themselves a bit more in a way rather than using drugs. Yeah. <laughs> Chemicals, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Well, not having to vaccinate for a start. Yeah. It was a bit, it's a big thing. But I mean, carving, isn't it? Carving. We have. Okay, a... Well, because we block carve, then everything happens in one go, then. So, you know, you don't want issues at carving. So, yeah, the califylum is going into the heifers and the dry cows and. We don't seem to get problems. We usually end up with a vet for one calving a year, usually, and it's usually calf upside down or something ridiculous then. But, you know, that the rest of them just tend to pop out then. So. Yeah, it's a bit of 
we still get mastitis, but we don't tend to use antibiotics anymore. So I made a stupid mistake of buying a box of tubes at the start of the year. At the start of carving, we always used to buy a box of tubes, but I think I used one tube and they've now gone out of date. Yeah, we've still got high cell count cows and especially milking once a day, it's more of a challenge. But the, the remedies tend to keep the keep them under control. Um, we've got quite a mature herd as well mm. now, haven't we? Because cows tend to have quite good longevity, so. Pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, we, you know. Um, we don't use any prids or cedars or anything like no, that. No, so no hormonal treatments. No. We then. use homeopathy for all that, don't we? Yeah, we don't even have like pre-heat checks or anything anymore. We just use homeopathy then, so. We'll put in a, a sort of mixture of remedies, sort of pre-service then. Yeah, I mean, serving always goes pretty well and we don't really get cows that don't come into heat. And yes, we do get some cows that don't get in calf, but I think last year it was, I remember off the top of my head, it was only about two and a half percent, doesn't it? Was mm. it that was empty, if that, I think. And we always try and put the apple cider vinegar and things into the drinking water for the cows um, in whichever paddock they're going into. So they're, they're getting sort of getting the benefits of that as well. And we're trying to get into the putting the tissue salts into the water through a, like a basic dosatron method then. So there's tissue salts going out into the water. I mean, I, I think all those sort of things are helping as well. We use kefir for the calves as well with the milk which I think has, well, I think it's made them a lot healthier. It's Sorry, uh, folks, we've lost the film. We're a big believer in that, aren't we? Yeah. We've got a good system with it, making kefir now. It's spot on with that one. I mean, homeopathy is a big thing for us. I think that's been a, made the biggest difference, perhaps in a way, for the health. But, oh, yeah, it's definitely a jigsaw. Jigsaw, definitely. That's coming together. It's yeah. joining the dots, I always put it as. Um it's all linked isn't it and yeah once you open your eyes and your mind to other things you know like to the homeopathy then you know you as i say you just take your blinkers off so you, you look anything's at, possible yeah you've got a mm. wider view of of life and what's out there and it's once you start looking i think you attract other things because you're thinking positively are you i don't know because we, we well and differently aren't you yeah. you're looking at you're looking at different things which you might not necessarily think are applicable to you, but you know it, it's always surprising where some of these things go. Then, isn't it? So. Okay, there we are. Um, <clears throat> sorry about the sound quality on that film. You can see it, or you will be able to see it, on the WAG website in due course and in our learning centre, um, which you can access. We'll give you those details in a moment. There's some time for questions uh, and, uh, and, and a little time for questions and discussion. Uh, not much, though. Um, one thing that um, I just would like to say, there's a number of technical questions that's, that's come up about um, sources of um, information, about books, about whether or not, for example, um, mixed mastitis nosos can be used as preventative at carving or presented early and so on. Uh, and a number of those things, a number of questions arising from Kate's presentation. <clears throat> um, some of these we can de deal with in detail in the session afterwards, starting at uh, quarter to one, which Sarah will give details about in a minute. Also, a lot of that information can be found on our learning hub, which we'll talk about again in a second. Um, but there were some questions for clarification or some questions which, which arose, which I would just like to dip into quickly. Earlier on, um, 
there was a question or a comment that said, these things are just common sense. Um, these things can be achieved um, by just normal regenerative. I'm not entirely sure these days what regenerative means, but uh, regenerative methods, um, organic methods and so on. Um, so you don't need cams, you don't need any of these remedies and so on. Um, and whilst um, some extent, or well, absolutely, our view, the whole health agriculture view is the underlying system and the balance within that system is absolutely critical. Um, I'd like if um, I'd like it if uh, Chris could just comment about the use of these approaches again within you know summarize within within the farming system. Maybe also there was a question from. Claire about the use of word remedies. What, what are you talking about in terms of remedies, in terms of homeopathy and herbal stuff? That came up, Chris, during your presentation. Um, but where do these fit within the whole farming system? Could you just kind of, I know you said it, you mentioned it in your talk, but could you just kind of come back to that and reiterate some of that? Those yeah, happily. I mean, th this is groundbreaking as an approach. And, 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 and it, when we talked about what we're going to do before this talk, we thought, well, to what degree shall we put this information across or be softer with it? Uh, and we chose to just put it as it is. And it's lovely seeing Gary and Sally at the end there, because this is two farmers just talking about in a very normal way how they approach it. We also put together the traffic light model with a real good intention behind it. Uh, for a long time, we've done what's called a, I know, uh, a, a two-phase two way, way of looking at health, where it's either sick or it's diseased. And they'll be fine as far as it goes. And it's essentially how the, the, the medical and veterinary professions work. Um, and I'm not belittling the veterinary profession. I really enjoy being a vet. I've been a vet for 36 years, and I'll continue to be a vet for many years to come, I'm pretty certain, until I retire. Um, and I have so many vets out there have complete respect for in terms of what we as a profession can achieve. We do great things. But we've got to put it in perspective. We are trained to look at disease. We're not trained to look at health. We're trained to look at what do we do when things go wrong. We're trained to look at differential diagnosis. We're trying to, to diagnose things to get the right treatments and so on, which is important because we come in with some quite heavy treatments sometimes, be it chemicals or be it surgery. So and what we do is absolutely and utterly amazing. And long may our profession continue to do that really, really well. Equally, I'm never going to belittle what farmers do. And I completely agree with everyone who says this is all down to good husbandry. I totally agree. I would much prefer that every farm out there upped it with their green and got their husbandry working fine. Because it all does come down to good husbandry. Whatever you mean by good husbandry. The degree to which we slip on our husbandry is the degree to which we create extra stresses of one sort or another. And those stresses become challenges and the challenges will weaken vitality and then the susceptibility can go up. That, that's all that's happening. Now, if you stay with a two phase model of health where it's either green or red, well, that's fine. That's what we're doing. But what would tend to happen is that you'll be doing green, 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 and suddenly you're not doing green and you're up in the red and you call the vet and they treat it and it goes back in the green, hopefully. And in a way, it's a bit like playing that game of cricket where you have like one hand behind your back. You can, you can sort of play, you can throw and you can catch and you can hit balls and things. Uh, but by having two hands, you give yourself a, a, a better ability. And uh, by, by introducing this concept of an of a in-between bit, a three-phase model of health, we got this idea then that it's not so much about conventional medicine or alternative medicine, where there's a battle going on about which one's the best one and you know, which one's got evidence-based medicine and all that sort of stuff. I, I, I don't like to create that sort of conflict going on. I flip it the other way around. I, I create this third phase where it goes from green through into the amber and into the red. And for anyone that's had any illness, just look inside yourselves and tell the truth. You know when you're, you're doing well and really vital, you know when you're slipping a bit, and then you know when you've got some sort of illness, whatever it is. And if you look at your livestock, you'll see the same things. You know when they're doing great, and if you just watch, you'll see things even before it's time to call the vet. You'll see things aren't quite right. Now, if you don't bother finding anything about cams, then you just keep watching and watching and watching them. And either they'll get better themselves, which many do, or they'll get worse and worse until you have to call the vet, which is fine, call the vet. By introducing cams approach, then you've got, you've got another tool. There's something else you can do. And I think that's, that's really vital. Now, in terms, again, the profession, for many years, people like myself and other, other holistic vets 
um, or other holistic owners for that matter, have been uh, like looking up to these red level trained vets and saying, please come down and learn a little bit of amber. Please come down and you know, guide us in the way that we can use these CAMS approaches. So many owners would prefer that, that the value profession, the medical profession embraced the, the, the wide range of resources available within the CAMS approach. And most vets don't seem that interested. Either they're not interested or they prejudged it or they're too busy. Yeah, I know, it, it's just the way that it is. That's the reality of it in my experience. Um, now, if any vet out there that's listening will prefer to, to know a bit more, like to sort of see how they can integrate this sort of approach, fine, come to WAG and then find out a bit more. Um, but I say it's, it's, it's about an integration process. It's about bigging up the green, learning this amber bit so you've got another skill set and completely honoring what those vets can do really well because there's so many things we can do really well and so many things will continue to evolve lastly i'm really aware that most good large animal vet practices nowadays are all about prevention which is fantastic and unless they can trained their prevention approach will be about improving the green and bringing in some low level red like vaccine protocols or worming protocols or whatever i'm having to be and, and we're saying, yeah, you can do that. And by introducing the CAMS bit, the AMBER bit, you can do way more than that. So yeah, I, I honor the profession and the way that it does the preventative stuff. That's fantastic. We're just saying, here's an opportunity to go beyond that if you want to. Does that answer the question, Lawrence? Yeah, it goes, it answers more than the question. I mean, the, the discussion in the chat is, you know, the relationship with vets and um, <clears throat> how uh, we're being, um, too hard on vets in this presentation so I'd just like to remind everyone who's saying that you know um, Ed and, and Claire and so on that the experiences um, we've had and actually some of us including myself by the way have practiced homeopathy and herbalism on a commercial farm what's the what the survey is reflecting is not the theory, you know, that vets are all about prevention and so on and so on. What we're reflecting is what the um, experience that farmers are having directly when they approach their vets and saying, can we make alternatives a key part of our farming system and management? So this is not kind of some, you know, this is not some academic exercise. We're actually saying, we're reporting on the experience the farmers that we're dealing with are having in the field. So um, having said that, whole health agriculture is about education, uh, is about the community of development of ideas. <clears throat> and we will certainly, and have always um, in various guises, attempted to reach out to vets Individually, we have good relationships with individual vets. There's no question there's some very good and responsive and empathetic vets around. Reaching out to the profession is a different ball game. And the profession often seems to be conducting a PR and a media campaign, which gets in the way of facilitation and true exchange of ideas. So I would say to the vets on the chat who are saying, uh, who are criticizing us for being too harsh. Okay, fine. Well, you step up to the plate and you go to your professional bodies and engage with us in a proper, in a proper discussion about these alternatives. And a pre prerequisite of that is learning from what these farmers are actually saying and this, this farmer experience. Um, to remind you again, we're going to hold uh, the Hoover session. We'll give you the link in a second. Um, we are, so let's deal with those questions and answers. The, um, the, um, the learning center, which we'll talk about in a second. If you can go back, uh, Sarah, and put another, go back to, to those slides, thank you. Um, just to, um, to reiterate some of these points. One, one thing is that what we'd like to get to get across and to take away is that these issues are not, we're not seeking to substitute um, alternatives, CAM methods, remedies, measures, medicines, and so on 
for whole system management. And maybe um, actually, Kate, there was one question, if you could just deal with this very quickly, which is the relationship between, you know, um, herbs as supplements or herbs as treatments and what can be done within, what can be done with herbs in terms of growing within the farming system. Just very briefly about, about how those two things link together. Yeah, of course, um, Lawrence, hold on. Is my, am I, uh, yeah, I am. Um, so for me, I think I summed it up in the old phrase, let food buy thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Um, if plants are available in pasture, you're boosting immunity and vitality on a, a food level, if you like. But so many of our native plants can be picked and prepared and made into medicines um, that can be used either internally or externally when you're heading up into that amber zone, um, which could potentially prevent you getting to the red zone. Um, I work with humans as a herbalist as well as with livestock. Um, and it, it's always a very difficult one to explain. I've given presentations to oncologists and all sorts of things. Um, and people want to see some of the science I find with the herbal stuff before they believe it works, which, you know, can be done, but it's, it's all a point from ground up. It, it's exactly like Chris said. You know, if you've got those plants available, you're in the green zone, and you see yourself creeping into the amber, then you've got the opportunity to use plants to stop you getting into the red zone. I'm not sure if that answered the question or not. But. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that, that, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so the the key points, um, I'm not sure now, um, Sarah, whether the slide is on the screen. I guess it is. Um, the key points we want to get across here is that we've undertook this survey. Um, of over 200 farmers, and that's on top of uh, years of experience in dealing and working with farmers on these alternatives. And the, the survey identifies some uncomfortable truths that, first of all, PAMs work, and they are transformational. The transformational at the farm level, and you heard um, Sally and Gary talk about that. They, they transformed how they went about their farming, farm management, their farm system. Um, I think Sally said that, or both of them said that, what working in this way changed their mindset. Someone else mentioned in the chat about if there's a need to change mindset, a need to change approach. Absolutely correct. Totally agreed with that. The way up these kinds of things, uh, this, this whole health, complementary alternative um, methods approaches this thing is to bring about change in mindset. That's transformational. And it transforms what happens on the farm, but it can also transform what happens within the farming and health system. There is no hiding. The, 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 the world cannot keep shuffling around in an embarrassed way about these truly transform, transformational alternatives. There's no hiding from the expertise and the experience of the farmers however much so-called experts and policymakers would like to do that. Farmers are making these things work. These are revolutionizing uh, the farm and the, the, what happens on the farm and the health of the farms, and indeed the well-being, the confidence and well-being of farmers. Those farmers have to be listened to. Homeopathy is often an entry point for changes towards truly holistic systems. We, uh, a number of people involved in, in WAG, including uh, Chris, who was uh, a founder member of the courses that are run under the label homeopathy at Welly level. When we went back to the, the students, the farmers who did the courses years and years ago and asked them what methods they were using, what remedies they were using, many of them said, well, not really, we're not really using very much any longer. And we, when we pressed that, we said, why? Well, because we started managing the system differently. We observed differently. We observed what our animals were doing. We observed the animals individually and we observed the animals in a herd. And we observed what was happening on the farm. And we learned that through trying to use these alternative methods. That's a mindset change. And that's why homeopathy is often the entry point to a truly holistic and changed system. And we get that we have to recognize that a whole health approach to health can lead to profound collective health benefits. 
The big thing these days is the so-called One Health policy, which makes the point of linking planetary health to human health and so on. That's great. But really to achieve what everyone hopes with that, the approach has to be a radical approach from the bottom up, not an approach from the top down, which is modifying existing systems. We have to modify existing systems, but we can't rely on that solely. So that's the mission for Home Health Agriculture. Chris, can you just talk about our learning center? Next slide, please, Sarah, just to um, point to where people can pick up more information. Just come to the end of our time, I'm aware of that, so it's going to be about 30 seconds to a minute max. Uh, uh, Whole Health Agriculture very proudly today launches its learning centre. Now again, it's just not about as an as alternative to your vets, it's absolutely not. It's about as an additional tool that you as a farmer can start to use to expand your skill at keeping animals really, really healthy. Um, basic membership is absolutely free. So you know, we really totally encourage you to go to check out the, the link below and go and see what's available there. And as a bonus, uh, today until midnight, you will have a little access to the little webinar we have as me and Kate go into a bit more depth on the approach to pests and parasites that a whole health approach can take. Only till midnight. So go and sign yourself up for free membership today and check out the link below. Back to you, Lawrence, and thank you very much, everyone, for listening. OK, thank you, everyone. Ben has been... Uh... Ben from the team has been uh, waving hands at me for ages to say our time is up. Um, sorry to press you and push the luck, Ben. Um, thank you to, um, to, to Ben and uh, Abigail for helping us from the OR, ORFC. Thanks to the WAG team. Um, the um, Whole Health Agriculture website, please go to that. Go to the Learning Centre, as Chris said. Join us in a moment. Thanks particularly to all our participating farmers for their insights, for their farsightedness, and for their courage in developing alternatives. And go back to the voice of the farmer, it's worth looking at all alternatives to antibiotic use because we're fast heading towards a nightmare scenario. This is too important to ignore. We can extend that. Antibiotic resistance is a symptom of a food and farming system in crisis. We need to look at radical fundamental alternatives that's based on the idea that health, whether of soil, plant, animal, and man is one and indivisible. Thank you very much for joining us.